Well, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce my friend and colleague, Dan Stenziano. Uh, I've known him uh, most of my life, <laughs> or it seems like anyway. I invited him here today to talk about the videos that he does in his YouTubing channel and um, some of the adventures he's had. So uh, I'm going to give it to him because I'm sure he's a much better speaker about these things than I could ever plan on being. Um, but one of the cool things is he's walked from Mexico to Canada twice. Imagine that. It's true. So, uh, and I'm probably one of his biggest fans on the YouTube channel. So, <laughs> has, so uh, after today, I'm sure you have a few more hits. Alrighty. So, so I'm going to give it over to Dan, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Maybe just a few answers and a lot of questions. And. Uh, um, Hopefully you like them as much as I do. So, there you go. All right, well, thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, yes, so my name is Dan Stenziano. Um, first of all, how's everybody doing? Pretty good. Good? Um, just thanks, everyone, for having me here today. Um, so what are we here to talk about? Um, we are going to talk about one of my films that I uh, have put on YouTube, and we're going to analyze its structure and talk about how I made it, and uh, for those of you who are, um, those of you who make videos or films or want to make videos or films, hopefully uh, my perspective can uh, maybe influence your process. So first I kind of want to just get a lay of the land. So who uh, in the room right now is a videography student? Anybody? Video student? Okay, uh, what about illustrators? Okay. Motion graphics, animating students? Yep. Okay, so for the motion graphics people, when we do show my film, uh, make sure you don't uh, laugh at any of my motion graphics I made in Final Cut. I know you guys use um, slightly more sophisticated programs. Um, anyway, so let's see. Okay, so about me. I'm Dan Stenziano. I am a uh, videographer, filmmaker, YouTuber, and Long distance hiker. So, what the heck is a long distance hiker? Um, first, let's take a look at my YouTube channel here. Um, so, that's me, that's my channel. I have around 7,000 subscribers. It's important to round up when you're trying to make yourself look good. Um, and here you can see my uh, most popular uploads the most viewed of which is this video here called the Super Sierra High Route. And that's been viewed around 100,000 times. And that's going to be the subject of my presentation today. That's going to be the uh, video that we are going to analyze and talk about. So let's give a little bit of background information. What the heck is long distance hiking? Well, as Kath mentioned, I have walked from Canada to Mexico twice. But that's uh, not really the telling the whole story. So to put it very briefly, long distance hiking is hiking a really long way with everything you need on your back. So food, clothing, shelter, water, that means you're sleeping in a tent on the ground carrying all of the food that you need for you know, up to a week at a time, getting all of your water from uh, natural sources. Does anybody in here like hiking? Does anybody in here go backpacking or has gone backpacking before? All right. So what do you think is like a pretty long way to hike? I don't know. Here are the two <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, 50 miles? Does that sound kind of far? Yeah. Really far. How about 100 miles? I have no frame of reference. No. What about 1,000 miles? Yeah. Or how about several thousand miles? You're talking to me with ant legs over here, so I mean, <laughs> Well, um, the longest hike that I've done is, uh, was 2,800 miles. And that was one of the times that I walked from Mexico to Canada. So I can say I walked across the country, but it was only the short way. Um, and this is a trail that goes um, from the Mexican border all the way to the Canadian border through the Rocky Mountain states. So it crosses through New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. 
and I hiked that from April to September of 2019, took about 132 days. So I could stand up here all day and talk about that experience, but I feel like it'll give you um, a better feel for it if you just watch uh, this little montage I put together of clips from the Continental Divide Trail. Those were, in fact, the first words that I uh, said after walking all the way from uh, Mexico to Canada. Anyway, so that gives you a... <laughs> uh, it's because I was running with the camera. Anyway, so that gives you a little bit of an idea what it's like to walk through these places um, and hopefully gives you a sense of how uh, the terrain changes, the seasons change, and maybe a little bit of um, how it might feel to walk that far. So. Uh, let's give a little bit more background information about long distance hiking before we go forward with the uh, main event, the uh, film that I'm going to show. So also known as through hiking, um, America's three most significant long trails are the Appalachian Trail. Has anyone heard of that one? Uh -huh. Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, that one goes uh, down the West Coast states, and the Continental Divide Trail. They're each between two and 3,000 miles long and together they are referred to as the triple crown of hiking. And I've done two out of those three, the Pacific Crest and the Continental Divide Trail. Um, it is common to start alone and make friends along the way. And uh, the two people that you will see featured in the film we're gonna watch are friends that I met on the Continental Divide Trail. Uh, people give each other silly names known as trail names um, because um, basically uh, when you walk a trail this far, it's basically like you're living this fantasy life and people kind of um, really lean into that by coming up with names that they only use on the trail. And you'll see some examples of that in the film. Uh, to resupply means to go into a town for more food, a shower, or a bed, because you're not carrying four months of food at a time. You're carrying usually like three to seven days of food at a time. And a zero day is a day off, zero miles covered. Those are kind of just the basics. So now let's give a little bit of background information about the video that we're about to watch uh, so that um, you're kind of as up to speed as we can get here. So the Sierra Nevada is a mountain range in California, also referred to as the High Sierra or just the Sierra. Um, has any, does anybody know roughly where that is or have you been there? I've been there. Has anybody been to Yosemite? So Yosemite is in the High Sierra. And uh, you'll see in that, I have a pointer, right? I got a pointer. Uh, so right there, that is where the High Sierra is. So it's uh, right in central California. And Yosemite is at the northern end of the Sierra there. Uh, Mount Whitney is the 
tallest mountain in the lower 48 states at 14,500 feet, and it is also located in the Sierra Nevada, and it is right down there at the southern end of the range. Um, the John Muir Trail, or also called the JMT, runs through the length of the Sierra for about 200 miles, uh, has been called America's most famous trail. It runs from Yosemite and ends at the top of Mount Whitney. And in that picture there in the bottom right, you can see the view from the summit of Mount Whitney. So pretty dramatic. Um, the John Muir Trail is a super, super popular trail. A lot of people hike it. A lot of people want to hike it. The permit process for it is pretty competitive. Um, now a route that kind of goes to the same places as the John Muir Trail, but is very, very different in character is the Sierra High Route. Um, the Sierra High Route also goes from Yosemite. It doesn't go to Whitney, but it goes down to the end of the range. It's different from the John Muir Trail in that it is not a trail. It's a route, meaning that you have to be able to navigate without a trail. I think you can probably imagine that hiking in the mountains without a trail, uh, for obvious reasons, is quite a bit more difficult than hiking with a trail. Uh, what do you think are some additional challenges that might uh, be presented hiking without a trail. Getting lost. Getting lost. That's an obvious one. Yep. Death. What's that? Death. De death. <laughs> 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 that could be a that could be an issue. That's something you want to generally try and avoid uh, is death. So <laughs> wildlife. Yeah, yeah. You generally do tend to see more wildlife off trail because fewer people means more wildlife. Um, because there aren't people to scare them off. Um, you're also not going to see any other people. It's way more remote. So you're basically going to be out there by yourself and uh, with anyone else who is in your hiking group. Um, also, trails make it easier to move through the mountains. Uh, without the trail, basically you're walking just on the mountains as they are. So that means loose, crumbling rock, um, steep uh, slabs of rock, uh, you know, mud, dirt, grass, all of that stuff um, without a trail to help you. So it's physically harder to move through the terrain. And uh, the Sierra High Route is basically like that. And that brings us to uh, the subject of my presentation today, the Super Sierra High Route. So I just told you what the Sierra High Route is. What makes uh, this route super and how is it different? So first of all, it's longer. It's 300 miles versus 200. So this route spans the entire uh, sort of geological length of the High Sierra, whereas the Sierra High Route only spans most of it. Um, and this route is significant because it's one that me and my friends basically made up. Um, nobody had hiked this route before we did it. and. We basically just took the Sierra High Route and extended it on either end with uh, other existing routes. Um, so you'll notice that this is quite a bit shorter than the Continental Divide Trail, uh, 300 miles versus almost 3,000. So the Continental Divide Trail is you know, 10 times as long as this. So it would seem like this is not as significant, but actually, in, in my mind at least, um, it's equally challenging, and that's because the Continental Divide Trail is a trail, and this is a route. Um, so after I finished the Continental Divide Trail, I wanted to do something to continue to challenge and push myself, but I didn't want to do anything longer. Um, I felt like you know, 2,800 miles, that was about as long as I wanted to hike in one go. And I didn't want to hike any faster, really, because there was a point on the CDT where I was doing, you know, back-to-back -back 35 or 40 mile days. Um, so how can I make something, you know, more challenging without just making it longer or faster? Well, the answer to that is take away the trail. And so that, you know, was the inspiration for this route. We, uh, me and two friends of mine that I had met on the Continental Divide Trail hiked it over the course of three weeks in August and September of 2020. So what we're going to do today is watch this film. Well, not all of it, because it's a 45-minute documentary. 
we're just gonna watch what I consider to be key sections of it that will hopefully give you a gist. And then we're going to, like I said, analyze its structure and talk about how I made it. Um, but before we get into that, any of that, um, I'm just going to play for you the first five minutes, the introduction. A high route is just like any other backpacking trip. Well, kind of, except for a few key differences. The main one is that there's generally no trail, just mountains, timeless and indifferent to human travel. And you walk through them, like this. Or like this. Sometimes, even like this. So you have to navigate the old-fashioned way by reading the terrain features on the topographic map. There's also a lot more elevation change on high routes, up to twice as much per mile as you'd find on, say, the John Muir Trail. As you might imagine, high routes travel through remote terrain, meaning it's likely you'll have the mountains all to yourself. And of course, the people you're with. All of this adds up to an experience that is engaging and challenging, offering true adventure and just a taste of real wilderness. My name is Dan Stenziano, and I like hiking. In 2017, I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail from Canada to Mexico, and in 2019, the Continental Divide Trail from Mexico to Canada. In 2018, I attempted a section hike on the Sierra High Road, but unfortunately was not successful, partly due to lack of off-trail experience and partly due to trying it alone. All right, so I'm gonna pause it right there because that little bit that I just mentioned um, is kind of an important theme that I'm going to come back to uh, several other times as we go through the film. It's going to be this theme of uh, failure and then, and then um, sort of personal growth and triumphing over that failure. So just keep that little bit in mind that I tried the Sierra High Route in 2018 and failed uh, because that's going to be significant theme going forward. A funny thing that myself and many other hikers do while hiking is to daydream of other hikes. For me, these dream hikes have usually been more far-fetched and adventurous than the trip I was on at the time. One that I kept coming back to was this idea of an extended high route that would span the whole length of the Sierra Nevada by connecting multiple existing routes. The fruition of that idea is the subject of this film. The first thing I did was enlist the company of some friends. I'm Armstrong. There's the silly names. Uh, grew up hiking in the Sierra. And, uh, yeah. Why do you live in a van? I don't know. <laughs> because I'm 
It's her bag, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, why else do you just want to live in a van? Our biggest logistical <laughs> task was figuring out where we were actually going to hike. We knew the route would include the Sierra High Route, which spans most of the length of the range, but unfortunately excludes Mount Whitney and the dramatic high terrain of the Southern Sierra. The solution to that problem was easy, as the Southern Sierra High Route connects to the Sierra High Route and extends past Whitney to the southernmost point of the range. On the northern end, things were not quite as clear. The Sierra High Route does reach into Yosemite, but we decided to extend the route to the northern boundary of the National Park using a fairly new route called the Yosemite High Route. The whole thing would be about 300 miles, and we figured we'd need between three and four weeks to do it. We called it the Super Sierra High Route. Okay, so that's the introduction. That's the first five minutes. So my goal with the introduction was to make sure, basically, that the viewer, the audience, is up to speed with everything that they're going to be seeing for the rest of the film. So I explain how a high route is different than a regular backpacking trip. Um, I tell about myself, uh, the previous hikes that I've done. I talk about my inspiration for this hike and I lay out in detail where we're going to be hiking. Without all of this context, uh, the film would just seem kind of like a string of events uh, that would be a little bit disjointed and people would kind of get lost and lose interest. So um, when you're doing anything long form, it's almost kind of like writing an essay. You really need to make sure that in the beginning you give your audience just enough so that they are going to be with you going forward. Um, so now what I want to do is hop out of here and go back to my slideshow and talk about the form of the film. So uh, here I have a little diagram that uh, kind of lays it all out. So this little tiny piece here, that's the introduction. Uh, the purpose, as I just said, inform the audience of what they're going to be watching. The Middle section, the, the meat and potatoes, is broken into three segments. And each segment corresponds with one of those routes that I mentioned. So the first part's dedicated to the Yosemite High Route. Part two is the Sierra High Route. And part three is the Southern Sierra High Route. And aside from just making it more sort of digestible and easier to watch, um, each of these sections has um, kind of a purpose and key moments. So the purpose of part one is uh, to show, actually, uh, I forgot to say one thing. Aside from just being a documentary about this route, I wanted this documentary to be um, kind of a showcase and a documentary about high routes in general, because this is a pretty niche kind of hiking. And even people who are regular backpackers might not be aware of high routes and uh, this kind of thing. So in addition to just being about our trip, I wanted this to be a documentary on high route hiking. Um, and I think it's pretty important when you set out to make a long film like this to really know um, sort of what your end goal is. What is the main point? Don't just start making something without having a very clear idea in your head what the subject of your film or documentary is going to be. So in part one, going back to that, I wanted to, oh, I've got a pointer. I keep forgetting I got a pointer. So, um, so I want to show in detail what day-to-day -day life is like on the route. And if I could hold it, it's just, um, and paint an even clearer picture of what a high route is. Um, so there are going to be some key moments in there where I kind of explain some technical stuff. Um, and then there's a moment where something kind of goes wrong um, to introduce a little bit of uncertainty and doubt. And then I'm going to uh, tie back to um, what I mentioned in the introduction that um, when I had failed on the Sierra High Route in 2018, sort of to reinforce that uncertainty. And then in part two, 
Um, the main theme of that section is going to be the personal growth and the triumph over uh, that past failure, um, kind of setting a more hopeful tone for the uh, third part. And then in the third part is basically kind of the grand finale, the climax of the route, uh, showcasing the most exciting terrain and climbs. Um, Mount Whitney. Mount Whitney is the high point and basically the end of the route, and therefore it is the logical high point and climax of the film. So throughout the documentary, I'm going to be mentioning Mount Whitney multiple, multiple times just to keep it sort of fresh in the audience's mind um, so that when we finally arrive to uh, Mount Whitney, it's kind of this big emotional moment and it makes sense and it feels kind of uh, justified and well-earned. So... That's kind of my thoughts in putting it together. Obviously, I didn't have all of this um, laid out neatly in my head before I ever started making it. It kind of evolved into this. But now let's go back and watch um, a few sections that are going to kind of highlight the things I just talked about. Hello, I'm here in Yosemite National Park, about to start a very interesting and ambitious route. Got the pack loaded up with seven and a half days of food and a bear canister, so feeling pretty heavy. But yeah, it's going to be an excellent adventure and I'm looking forward to seeing what the next three and a half weeks or so have in store. The Yosemite High Route begins up in the northwest corner of the park an area that feels very wild and remote. In fact, it's unlikely that you'd ever be sharing places like this unnamed sandy lake with anyone but the local residents. High routes are notorious for being extremely physically demanding, but actually, the terrain on our first couple days felt a bit like a warm-up for what was to come. Still, it was hard work, and by the end of day two, I was really feeling it. About to descend to our first camp. Well, I guess our second camp, but our first camp after our first full day on the high road. Down there at Rock Island Lake. Fourth cross-country pass of the day. Really kicked my butt. I didn't think I was going to make it. 4,900 feet of vert today. We really about 12 and a half miles. Our next destination is Matterhorn Pass, which is right there. How are we feeling about it? Excited. Excited. I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be spicy. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here at the base of Matterhorn Pass. We've got a thunderstorm threatening. Trying to find the best way up. Hopefully either the storm holds off or we can make it up and over before it starts because that's the last thing I want to be doing is uh, down climbing class two or three loose garbage in the rain. So fingers crossed. So you're going to hear me mention class two and three scrambling somewhat frequently. In case you didn't already know, class one means walking. Class two means scrambling where your hands are only used for balance. A little like this. Class three means scrambling where your hands are supporting some of your weight, maybe with a bit of exposure. Kind of like this. Yeah, if you just like keep your left foot there, drag your right foot down, you'll find some solid stuff where you can put your right foot.
Okay, so that last part was important because there's a lot of times going forward where I mention, you know, this pass is class two, this mountain is class three. That's just another example of, I need to make sure that my audience is on the same page. They didn't already know those terms, now they do. Um, all right, now we're going to skip ahead a little bit to the first time something sort of goes a little bit uh, wrong. We are on our way up to Kuna Crest, specifically that saddle above the snow, class two pass. It is actually a bit sketchier than I thought. As you can see up close, it's very loose. I've already sent some rock sliding, so I'm just picking my way very carefully up. It's true that it's only class two, but it's loose class two. It's a little bit scarier than some of the class three I've been on, but we'll get up it. All right, I made it to the top, but my ride up was basically idiotic. So I moved some kind of big rocks and I should have taken the route. I should have taken the route that the other guys took. I'm going to go ask them how it was for them. So real quick, tell us why what I did was stupid. Uh, because it was an easier way? <laughs> I guess that basically sums it up. <laughs> My mishap on Kuna Crest reminded me that things can go wrong on a high route, even on a seemingly routine Class 2 pass. Much harder passes and peaks would come as we hiked further south, culminating with a Class 3 climb up the tallest mountain in the lower 48, Mount Whitney. Okay, so there we're mentioning Mount Whitney again. Uh, so we're mentioning Mount Whitney again, kind of just keep that fresh in the audience's mind. And, uh, you know, Mount Whitney is that, that goal, what we're moving toward. It's the climax of the film, and so we're going to keep kind of hammering that home. Now we're going to skip ahead a little bit more. Um, I'm going to touch on that uh, theme of failure and personal growth again, uh, just with a little bit of voiceover dialogue. I remember saying... Nope. Armstrong and Mudslide on day one, that if I could make it through the first resupply, I could make it all the way to Whitney. To be perfectly honest, I didn't even know if I would be able to handle a route like this. Because I had failed on a high route attempt in the past, completing this one felt far from guaranteed. So on our eighth day, I felt a great sense of accomplishment and a hopefulness for the rest of the route as we hiked around the beautiful minarets and finally into Red's Meadow for a well-earned zero day. Okay, so we're mentioning Whitney again. We're tying back to that failure theme. Um, some important dialogue there. But we're going to get to climb in the shade, so that's nice. Later today we will have Snow Tongue Pass, which is supposed to be one of the hardest passes, if not the hardest pass on the high route, so I think we're all a tiny bit nervous about it, but we'll see how it goes later. So I just crossed over the Paiute Pass Trail, and that is significant because in 2018, on my attempted section hike of this part of the Sierra High Road, I bailed on the Paiute Pass Trail to the JMT um, because I had just crossed the Glacier Divide, which is, uh, lies just ahead, over Alpine Coal, which is actually an easier, supposedly easier alternate to the actual Sierra High Route, which goes over Snow Tongue Pass. Um, there are multiple ways you can cross the Glacier Divide. At the time, I found Alpine Coal very difficult and a little bit traumatic, and uh, after I had gone over that and got down here into Humphreys Basin, I decided I didn't want any more cross-country travel, so yeah, I failed. But this year, uh, after crossing Paiute Pass Trail, I'm going to continue on and cross Snow Tongue Pass, the pass I was too afraid to try the first time around. It just goes to show you that uh, 
the more you do this kind of stuff, the more comfortable you get and the more capable you become. That's all you chose to clear your route. What's that? Nothing, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get ahead of you before you go over me here. <laughs> I guess this uh, small patch is all that's left of the snow tongue this year. Up there is the pass. Armstrong found some interesting, not quite on route, class three rock. Might be preferable to the loose stuff. Honestly, if you saw the route ahead, you'd think this is on route. Holy shit, no, I'm stuck. <laughs> so are you having fun yet? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little bit in the type two category for me. Ah, oh, uh -uh. Type one. Except for when you're like plowing up the dirt loose shit that's just like getting in your shoes and it's fucking tight fuckers. <laughs> 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 Snow Tongue Pass. This one is going firmly on my never again list, but uh, glad that I saw it through and made it to the top. Given the choice between this and Alpine Coal, I would choose Alpine Coal, and I thought that was horrible at the time. Makes you a wahoo, I think. Yeah, but then that's the same conclusion. <laughs> that last part was nice. <laughs> Standing on a bunch of hopes and dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Whose hopes and dreams were you standing on? My own. <laughs> Okay, so that's uh, Snow Tongue Pass, and that's kind of where we wrap up that theme of having failed on a high route in the past and then finally uh, getting it done. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. This stretch is winding down. After climbing Snow Tongue Pass, I felt like our group could handle just about anything and I was excited, not worried, about the challenges that would come on the Southern Sierra High Route. Big Class 3 climbs like Mount Sill and the Mountaineers Route on Mount Whitney lay ahead. But now, the mountains felt like home, and I was connecting and engaging with the landscape more than ever. Okay, so there's wrapping up part two. Uh, tying in again to Mount Whitney, which is coming up and sort of setting a hopeful tone going forward. Now I'm going to skip ahead um, to one more kind of difficult climb that sort of threw a wrench in things and uh, kind of shook up our confidence a little bit. M call, by the way. From here you can actually see uh, quite a bit of our route moving forward. Um, our next objective is that peak right there. That is Mount Baxter. And uh, what we're going to do is cross the uh, basin and some lakes and stuff, and then we will gain the north ridge of Mount Baxter, which is supposed to be easier than it looks. Um, the whole thing is supposed to be only class two. It looks rather imposing. So 
we are ascending to that ridge I mentioned, the north ridge of Baxter. Our objective is this chute right here. It looks uh, steep and a little bit loose. But that'll take us to the ridge, which we can then take right to the summit. When you're trying to make miles, you don't always make the smartest decisions. We started up Mount Baxter late in the afternoon, naive to how difficult the climb would be. As it turned out, the chute was extremely loose, and the ridge that was described in the guide as solid was anything but. Imagine trying to climb a 600-foot pile of broken chunks of sidewalk. Can I compete yet? Nope. We tried to get up as fast as we could, but by the time we arrived at the summit, it was almost 7.30, and we were losing light fast. One thing we did know was that the descent was not going to be any easier. If you've never descended a steep, loose talus slope by headlamp, I definitely do not recommend it. So, let me tell you about what happened last night. Uh, had a little bit of an adventure. So first off, Mount Baxter is tough. Uh, the, the guidebook makes it sound easier than it is. Definitely some hard class two, class three moves that are kind of exposed right near the summit. It was sketchy as hell. Um, beautiful views though, I mean, I get, Probably not too many people get to see sunset from up there because, you know, if you're sane and you planned your day well, then you, you wouldn't be up there at sunset. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm going to get walking. If it seemed like our struggle on Mount Baxter came out of nowhere, that's because it did. Things had been going smoothly for so long, I had let my guard down. But high routes always have the potential to throw you a curveball. I will admit, the incident had shaken my confidence a bit. If Baxter, which is technically only rated class two, gave us this much trouble, what was the Mountaineers route on Mount Whitney going to be like? What was the Mountaineers route on Mount Whitney going to be like? Let's find out, we're gonna skip right to it. Tulaneo Lake is simply incredible. It's, just, it's a massive high elevation lake nestled in this basin with no inlet or no outlet. We are pretty close to 13,000 feet and to see a lake of this size, it's just unbelievable. Today's going to be a fun day. It's Whitney Day. Our next objective is right there, Russell Perry on Cole, Class 3 climb. summit of Mount Whitney. You can get a good picture of at least the beginning of the route here, an ascent of that gully up to that notch, and then you'll go around the other side up to the summit. Feeling good? <laughs> Feeling good? Mmm. <laughs> mmm. Mm. What does that mean? Me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's another important theme. <laughs> So there's a little emergency shelter on the top of the mountain in case you were confused about that. Anyway, so that is the, the big moment, the climax of the route and of the film. And I think because we had been mentioning it consistently throughout the film, um, oscillating between uh, hopefulness and uncertainty and doubt about this climb, um, finally when we do arrive there, I think it feels uh, very justified and, like I said before, well-earned. And, you know, we've got this uh, dramatic, emotional uh, building up music and then the resolution uh, right at the top of the mountain there. So that's pretty much it. Um, there are a few minutes of the film left, which are kind of just a uh, recap, thoughts on the route, and kind of like a little sentimental uh, recap montage of clips. Okay, so there's our form. Um, we could talk about what I used to shoot this, um, anything about how to actually go about shooting this way, how I edit. Um, so any or about the route itself or that kind of hiking or hiking in general, any questions that uh, might pop into your head. Um, yeah? What did you eat? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of junk food is the short answer, but... Um, Cliff bars were a staple on the menu. Um, trail mix, chips, that kind of thing, ramen noodles, uh, protein bars. Nothing that you really want to eat for three weeks straight, but <laughs> basically you have to um, prioritize things that are really calorically dense and won't go bad. And so that ends up being a lot of junk food. <laughs> yeah? On average, how long can you walk per day well, it really depends on the kind of terrain and whether there's a trail or not. Uh, with this kind of stuff, at max, we would do 15 miles a day. But um, when I was at sort of like my peak fitness on the Continental Divide Trail, like I said, I could do 35, 40 miles a day. But that's on trail. So that kind of speaks to the, the um, extra element of difficulty that um, hiking off trail adds. It basically almost cuts your mileage in half. Were you concerned about water quality? Did you have chlorine pills or iodine pills or something? Please? I carried a little uh, filter that screws on to your water bottle, but actually a lot of the sources up in the Alpine in the Sierra are pretty pristine. So like if I knew it was flowing right from a glacier or something, oh, yeah. then I would drink it straight. But if we were down kind of in the lower elevations, like in a meadow or something, then I would definitely filter it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your directing process? Because you're going on this hike, you have all this gear, you're, you're thinking about documentary filmmaking, like what's going on in your head? It can be a little distracting. And, and in fact, sometimes uh, I find myself almost wishing I could uh, kind of just immerse myself in the experience a little bit more. But I'm always sort of thinking, oh, man, this could be a good shot. Or like, oh, I need to stop and like make sure I say something about this. Or And like the worst thoughts I have would be like, hmm, maybe something will go wrong and it'll be... <laughs> make for some great content <laughs> but uh yeah it's kind of like always having to be a thought in the back of my head um and besides that you're you're backtracking to film your friends <laughs> and then you're backtracking to go back and get your camera because you just showed yourself walking through a meadow and now you gotta go back and get 
the camera. Yeah, so every time that there was a shot of me walking, you know, like 50 yards uh, in front of the camera, um, my dumbass has to walk back and grab it and then keep walking. So, um, yeah, bonus miles. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, in the beginning, like, when you first started to, like, hike, like, what was your mentality and, like, how, like, did this, like, long hike and trail, like, improve or mess with, like, your mental health at all or anything like that? How did it affect you? That's a good question. I think that, well, my, my original inspiration for doing long hikes like this was uh, just the feeling that I got uh, when I'm in the mountains. Um, I, I first went out west and saw mountains like this in 2015. And um, I just remember being so amazed and blown away by them and feeling like so peaceful and happy and excited sometimes when I was in the mountains that I just wanted to repeat and extend that experience as much as I could. And so that's what led me to doing uh, longer and longer hikes. And um, in terms of mental health, I think there was a period of time where I was a lot happier when I was on trail than when I wasn't. And so I actually, you know, for obvious reasons, that's not healthy. So I, what I sort of worked to do is um, think about what it was that made me happy on trail and kind of bring elements of that into my off trail life so that I wasn't sort of using the mountains and trail kind of like as an escape from daily life. What's your, uh, the wildest creature or uh, obstacle that you came across while doing this? While doing this, I um, saw a black bear and a um, bighorn sheep were the two most interesting wildlife sightings on this route. Um, overall, the, the wildest thing I've seen up close is a grizzly bear, and that's a little bit scarier than seeing a black bear. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the wildest experience, I mean, kind of seemed like every day there was a wild experience climbing one of these peaks or passes. It looked like, uh, pretty much like Jenga. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, anything where there's loose, big chunks of rocks that could send uh, the rocks and you sliding down a mountain is uh, pretty scary. <laughs> How do you manage to keep all this equipment on you while like, not letting it get in the way of your scaling of these massive sizes? So the equipment actually is uh, kind of minimal. Um, this is the camera I shoot on, and this lens is not even the one that I brought on that trip. What I shot that video with was actually this tiny little pancake zoom lens. And I only carried one lens. I have two up there, but those are just two that I would use uh, for different purposes. Um, I don't know if anyone here is like into camera gear or anything. We could talk about that stuff. But basically just one camera, one small camera, one zoom lens, and a little shotgun mic that I would mount on the top of the uh, camera to get better audio. So the total package is not that big and usually I would carry it just in like a little waste pack and it would be kind of just like right here um, at all times so that I could just unzip it, grab the camera and shoot. Uh, some people will even like hang it on a shoulder strap. There are clips that you can mount cameras to shoulder straps. Um, I that was exactly my thought, and that's why I didn't go that route, because I was worried about banging it on stuff. So at least in a waste pack, it's a little bit more protected and still fairly accessible. I will say that, um, especially when you have to like raise your legs really high, it does get in the way, and sometimes I would hit it. And I think there were probably times where I would have been a lot less freaked out if I didn't have like a camera that I was bumping with my legs. <laughs> yeah, do you use like, any solar power uh, panel? Like Reasonable, uh, equipment at all or no? So um, I did carry a power bank, just a 10,000 milliamp hour power bank. Uh, no solar panel though. Um, basically the 10,000 milliamp hour battery, it's just like an anchor, the, the basic one. Um, that's enough to keep my camera and my uh, flashlight, which is rechargeable, and my phone charged for about seven days, which was the longest 
uh, resupply that we did. So actually I was pretty much running out of power on all my devices by the end of that seven days. So that kind of, yeah, uh, stretched it to its limits. And then uh, when we would go, so two times during this route, we went out of the mountains and um, went into, well, actually the first time there was like a little um, resort slash campground um, in the mountains called Red's Meadow. And we stopped there and they had um, like food and outlets and stuff. And so I could charge all of my devices there. And then later on in the route, we hiked out of the mountains and went to a town uh, called Bishop. And we stayed at a campground that had showers and outlets and stuff and uh, recharged the devices again there. So it really takes a lot of planning. Oh yeah, the lo it's pretty logistics heavy, especially uh, something like this. Uh, where there's, like with a trail, you can kind of just like show up and walk and follow the signs. But with this, you have to actually plan out exactly where you're going. So, um, yeah, and where you're going to get your food, all of that sort of stuff. It's kind of cool to see all those like glacial features that, you know, previously were made back in time though. Yeah, the, the glaciers were particularly impressive and like just being right up close and seeing them, it's, it's beautiful. Actually, it can be a little bit sad too. And like if you see pictures of how big the glaciers used to be, um, a lot of them have just, well, all of them have been reduced dramatically in size. Um, so it's always kind of like a constant reminder um, if you're traveling through like glaciated terrain uh, that yeah, climate change is having real tangible effects um, and you can see it personally. What's your next trip, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next trip, I'm going out this summer in July. Um, I'm going to do a loop around Mount Rainier in Washington. Um, going to do some shorter high routes in Washington in the mountains there. Then I'm going to return to the Sierra and uh, do a different but similar route to this. Um, just kind of more of the same. <laughs> and, and you'll film it as well? Yeah, I'll be I'll be filming it. Um, no, actually, these uh, those two guys are occupied with other stuff this summer. So actually, uh, Amy here will be joining me on the uh, loop around Rainier, and um, a couple of I have some friends in Seattle who I'm going to be doing the other stuff in Washington with, and then I have a buddy who lives in uh, California that I uh, met on the Pacific Crest Trail like five years ago, and we're going to be doing uh, some high route stuff. In the Sierra. Do you ever think about doing like New York City to San Francisco or LA? Oh, you mean like a like across the country the long way? No, that's too far. <laughs> Ain't no guts, no luck. Yeah. <laughs> have you been in the Grand Canyon? Yeah, I've actually uh, done the. I don't know if we have time for that, but I have uh, hiked the Grand Canyon. Uh, what they call the rim to rim to rim. So you start on the south rim, you hike down, and then up to the north rim, and then you hike all the way back. Uh, it's like 40, 45 miles or something. Oh, I would be thinking about a little bit of hills that advice. Yeah, no, oh, God. <laughs> There's a bar yeah, try not to think about that. There's a bar on both sides of those climbs. <laughs> well, uh, but yeah, we definitely got a drink when we finished, but uh, not at the North Rim. Uh, yeah, hiking and beer don't always go uh, hand in hand. That's why I don't do it anymore. <laughs> 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 who, so, who else has done something similar to this? Jeff, I know you've, you've hiked around. In my youth, I, yeah, my youth, I did uh, some of the Rocky Mountains, and it was very much just, you took off and off the wind. And you know, the hardest part for me was always the talus pop, because you never knew what oh. it was going to be like. I was always scared on those. And then stuff recently, like, since I'm getting a little bit old, is more traditional mm -hmm. trail, what they don't call the trail things. Right. Yeah, talus is, well, can be a nightmare. <laughs> Talus is basically uh, large chunks of rock, usually granite, anywhere from like microwave to refrigerator size. And sometimes it's on a steep slope and sometimes it's loose. And uh, yeah, not very fun. After seeing this and hearing from Dan, who wants to start something like this? All of you? Oh, we, got <laughs> we got one. You don't have to start with this. Um, you know, th this is something that I did like years after doing uh, stuff that was easier than this. Oh yeah, I've done all the 46 high peaks. Yep. 
Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks.